So um, the first item on the agenda, welcome everyone, first of all. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Two brief updates. First, remind folks that next Monday, we do have a board meeting, November 22nd. That will start at 1 p.m. And the topic of the meeting is the 2020 ACO quality and financial performance. Uh, in addition, we have two ongoing public comment periods. Uh, the first is related to today's item of um, discussion, which is the state's, uh, the Vermont Health Information Exchange um, plan. And that public comment period is open through November 25th. I'm sure we will hear more from the presenters today um, on next steps there. And then I just want to highlight um, related to the um, One Care Vermont FY22 budget, we have we we still are, have open public comment. We're asking folks to uh, submit their comments by December 1st in order to be considered ahead of the Green Mountain Care Board staff presentation, which is on December 8th or by December 17th to be considered ahead of the potential Green Mountain Care Board vote, which is tentatively scheduled for December 22nd. Uh, we heard from some folks that they wanted a little more time for comments to be considered by the board. So we uh, just wanted to, I wanted to point that out uh, for the board and for the public. And that is all I have to report. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Friday, November 5th, Monday, November 8th, Wednesday, November 10th, and Friday, November 12th. Is there a motion? So moved, all four of them. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve all four uh, minutes without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record indicate that it was unanimous approval of the minutes. So next, um, we're going to the main purpose of today's meeting, and uh, that is the uh, Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan and 2022 Connectivity cri Criteria. And for the purposes of that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate O'Neill, who will tee things up, and then we'll introduce our presenters. So thank you, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm getting uh, my slides up. You can see them, hopefully. We can. <clears throat> so good afternoon. I'm Kate O'Neill, and I'm on staff at the Green Mountain Care Board. And uh, I serve as the Director of Data Management Analysis and Data Integrity. So to start, I'll do just a very quick introduction um, today to cover the statutory authority for the board, and then I'll hand it over to uh, the presenters from AHS and Vital to present on the plan itself. And then after that, I'll come back and uh, share with you the staff review of the uh, update to the HIE plan and the 2022 connectivity criteria. So today we'll be talking about the two responsibilities that the board has related to HIT and Health Information Exchange. And first, uh, it's reviewing and approving the state HIT plan. We now call it the HIE plan. And the board's authority is focused on whether or not the plan will support achieving the principles uh, for healthcare reform. And uh, the HIE plan uh, statute in section 9351 outlines a variety of features the HIE plan must address or include. The Department of Vermont Health Access within the Agency of Human Services is required to revise the HIE plan annually with a comprehensive update every five years. And currently, um, we uh, so the current HIE plan was approved originally in 2018, and then there were annual updates in 2019 and 2020, and now this is the 2021 update that's before the board today. 
And then second, the board is required to review connectivity criteria for providers connecting to the Vermont Health Information Exchange or the VHI. Uh, VITAL is required to present criteria for approval annually before March 1st. But since 2019, we've been reviewing those criteria for the coming year in conjunction with the board's HIE plan review. And so we're, we're going to be doing the same thing today. So that's why you're uh, reviewing both of them at the same time. So uh, that just sets it up. And now I will turn it over to uh, Emily Richards and, um, and our colleagues at Vital and um, to do the presentation. And then I'll return after uh, they're done and I'll walk through the staff analysis. Great, I'm, I'm just gonna share my slides here. It'll just take me a moment. trying to get all the screens right so I can see you and the slides at the same time. And everybody see the slides okay? We can. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Ina, do you want to get started? Introduce us in the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ina Backus. I'm the Director of Health Reform and I've been having discussions uh, with the board lately on other topics, but I'm excited to be here today um, to be sharing the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan 2021 update. And I know that this board has received this plan update um, in past years, and a particular difference with the update this year is that I am an accompanying Emily in providing this update. And that is because the Health Information Exchange Group has joined in the Office of Health Reform in the Secretary's Office at the Agency of Human Services. I know that you're familiar with this um, arrangement of activities within AHS because it was um, a part of our strategic plan for improving our overall performance and health reform and uh, engagement with the all payer model agreement. Um, and as a part of this plan, I have been serving as the chair for the health information uh, exchange um, steering committee. And this, this all represents a significant uh, difference from, again, last year's update um, where the HIE program sat with the Department of Vermont Health Access. And this update is in service of truly aligning our health reform initiatives, including um, HIE as the backbone for payment and delivery system reform um, as, as a critical and key partner for our blueprint um, for health as it long has been, um, and working with the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative all together um, and moving health reform forward. So th again, thank you for, for having us today and I'll ask Emily to introduce herself now. Thanks, Ina. Um, I'm Emily Richards. I'm the director of the Health Information um, Exchange Program at AHS. And we're also joined by Beth Anderson and Carolyn Stone from VITAL. Um, and I'd like to thank them for being on the line and available to answer any questions about VITAL's progress. And at the end of this presentation, Carolyn will walk us through the update to the, uh, the state's connectivity criteria for the VHI. Mm -hmm. So to jump right in, um, so today we're going to um, review the core concepts underpinning the HIE plan in Vermont. Um, as a reminder, I know, of course, the board has reviewed this plan for a number of years, uh, but those plan core concepts um, really fuel our trajectory in terms of health information exchange progress. So we want to make sure that um, sort of what's driving strategic planning is well understood. So we'll walk through those first. 
Um, then we'll jump into what's been accomplished in 2021 with a brief overview and a look ahead to 2022 plans. Um, and then jump back to that to the HIE ecosystem um, or component parts that allow us that allow us to progress health information exchange efforts in Vermont um, and take those one by one and look at accomplishments and what's ahead. Okay, so the core planning concepts of the strategic plan. Um, so as Kate mentioned, this plan is called for in Title 18. Um, AHS in consultation with the HIE Steering Committee comes together every year to administer the plan, evaluate and update each year. Um, and we're, with re a real focus on integrating electronic health information infrastructure to support sharing of electronic health information. Um, so the plan itself cover, covers three essential elements, uh, Vermont's specific vision and goals for the exchange of health data, which we'll look at again today, the HIE ecosystem or the, the environment required for HIE to effectively function, and clear objectives and tactical plans um, for uh, achieving um, progress towards this vision. And as everyone remembers, um, the reinvigoration of this plan a few years ago was really focused on a transparent and an accountable path towards progress. So we're continuing to focus on that um, as we look ahead. So considering our goals um, statewide, um, a few years ago, we looked across use cases or the ways in which um, users would benefit from health data and the access to health data and the uh, action of uh, exchanging health data and realized that really um, sort of all of those myriad use cases roll up into three universal goals uh, that can act as our North Star for planning. So we continue to look towards these and drive towards these in our activities, which are detailed in the strategic plan. The first goal is to create one health record for every person. And the idea here is to support optimal care delivery and coordination by ensuring access to complete and accurate health records. Um, in the last couple of years, we've talked about an increased access, patient access to health records. So this is also in service of uh, um, optimal care delivery and care coordination um, by having patients really um, empowered to participate in their care. Having one record serves multiple parties. Second goal here is to improve healthcare operations. So enriching healthcare operations through data collection and, and analysis to support quality improvement and reporting. Basically making sure that um, healthcare operations can be data informed. Um, putting uh, the appropriate data uh, in the arms of folks um, to uh, understand uh, performance management and improvement. And the use of data to enable investment and policy decisions is our final goal here. So this is a look at bolstering the health system's ability to learn and improve by uh, using accurate comprehensive data to guide investment of time, labor, and capital and inform policymaking and program development, which I think the audience here um, can really understand. So looking um, at our next core concept here, um, the HIE ecosystem, or again, the environment required to progress HIE activities. So when we started strategic planning a few years ago with the HIE steering committee, um, we acknowledged that there had been this sort of myopic focus on technology um, as the singular approach to advancing health data exchange. When in reality, we need this um, sort of marriage of financing our resources to support activities, policies, and processes that enable data exchange and an effective governance model, all to work in concert with uh, technical capabilities. Um, and so the strategic plan really acknowledges that and takes a, a apart each component um, of the HIE ecosystem and looks at how it would need to be advanced to further our goals. So this um, kind of shootout of technology is also acknowledging um, that our uh, technology to to enable health data exchange is modular and it begins at a foundation with a foundation so i often use the metaphor of a house you have to build the the um, foundation of the house before before you can pick out the curtains or the paint color and it's sort of the same concept here public investment is really focused on ensuring that we have core uh, 
technical capabilities to collect and um, safely exchange health data. Um, and once those core capabilities are in place, we can do things like extract data for analysis, support coordination of care, um, provide data for consumer tools, and all the sort of data uses that you might think of when you think of health data. Um, so all these concepts are, are important to our strategic planning um, so that we are focusing our efforts on building foundational services to enable uh, the use cases that uh, um, are clearly out there. So moving on to who develops the plan itself. So in 20, late 2017, um, we pulled together, we at HS pulled together the Health Information Exchange or HIE Steering Committee. Um, our, uh, diligent, uh, passionate, and small group to pull together um, an HIE strategic plan to really get our HIE efforts back on track on the state, and again, to provide an accountable and transparent look at progress ahead. Um, so this is how the group has evolved to date. Um, these are the members of the group. It's still a, a relatively small group, but the idea is that we have representatives from across the continuum of care who can reflect different perspectives on, on the strategic planning process and also who can act as liaisons to their own groups um, to further our health uh, data exchange goals uh, statewide. Um, so moving on, um, and just sort of a final core concept here that I wanted to go over was kind of the structure of governance um, of health information exchange here in Vermont. So if we start at the top, where do stakeholders convene to discuss HIE matters, set priorities, and propose policy? That's the HIE Steering Committee. Um, this group develops, uh, executes, and evaluates the HIE plan, which we're discussing today, and monitors performance and operation, operational and administrative support with, excuse me, with operational administrative support from the HIE unit. Um, where do decision makers go for support? And decision makers, we're talking about the steering committee. Um, we're pointing to subcommittees here. So we use subcommittees to um, really gather technical insights and expertise on uh, particular topics and feed up in, into the steering committee. Um, and sometimes those are short-term groups and some of the steering committee, the subcommittees we've had for a long time. Who's responsible for oversight? Of course, that's the Emily, can I care. just jump in sure. here for just a Please. second? Um, just to observe here that the subcommittees are very active and are deeply engaged in a number of topic areas, which we'll elaborate on, but that um, they they really drive a lot of the priorities for the steering committee. And I, I just have observed, since I have been the chair for only so long, I've observed um, the great amount of work that the subcommittees are churning out in particular related to prop projects like claims and clinical data integration. That's a really great point. Um, and I think that's a great way to point out kind of this relationship between strategic planners at the sort of the macro level um, and uh, the, the folks who are looking at really specific topics and doing um, sort of timely work to advance um, health information exchange strategies. It's a good point. Um, hey, how's it going, Ben? So looking at um, oversight, of course, the Green Mountain Care Board's role, um, Kate pointed out um, the statutory authority to approve the statewide HIE plan and vitals budget annually. Um, those who provide HIE services include vital and other HIE service vendors like by state primary care and one care who are providing uh, services related to health data exchange in the in the state and how our service providers held accountable. And so um, we've talked about this over the past few years, but the state's contractual relationship with vital has evolved and uh, now really reflects um, how we hold uh, vital accountable for performance um, in service of advancing the strategies that we've articulated in the HIE plan. Um, and for those not presenting, if you don't mind putting yourself on mute, that would really help. All right, so um, those are sort of the core concepts that underpin planning um, and really allow us to create a framework for thinking about how we'll advance health information exchange in the state. Um, before I move on to 2021 progress and um, how we're thinking about next year, any questions on this? Okay. Everyone's sort of old hat at those, so thanks for letting me review them. Um, okay, so let's jump into um, a couple of things that have advanced this year and how we're thinking about next year. 
So first wanted to start by saying um, Health Tech Solutions, which is a known group to us, they came um, to the state in 2017 and 2017, or excuse me, 2018 to evaluate um, our health information exchange efforts, governance model, the framework um, that we're using to um, uh, articulate our needs and advance our health information exchange journey. Um, they've come here and they've they've done comprehensive evaluation and we asked them to come back uh, this past year to again look at our uh, HIE plan to ensure we're on track, that we're in alignment with national uh, initiatives and uh, sort of market evolutions um, and to, you know, do a gap analysis for us to help us continually improve. And to kind of summarize their findings, they concluded that our health information exchange strategy is um, is uh, and direction, excuse me, are correct for accomplishing the goals as we've set, set out in the HIE plan. The health data architecture and the VHI data model, which we'll talk more about today, um, are appropriate for what we're trying to accomplish, meaning that we've got the appropriate core uh, technical infrastructure to, to um, uh, further our goals. And finally, stakeholder alignment is critical for success. And I know Ina wants to say more about that one. But before I turn it over, the final thing here I'll just point out is the they were really key in helping us articulate the sort of transition that Vermont's in from a first generation HIE model to a second generation model. And so what they're saying is that the VHI is rap rapidly transitioning from a first generation HIE based on the sharing of clinical information from and to the point of care. So thinking about how HIE would support direct care um, to a second generation HIE, which with a much more robust assortment of data types and services offered. So in a way we're at a pivotal point um, where the technologies that we have um, are really allowing us to do what we had envisioned in terms of health data exchange and service of care delivery. And now we can think about new uses of data services and health data itself. But, you know, I'll turn it over to you to think uh, to expand on how stakeholder alignment is critical for our success. success. Thanks, Emily. The second generation HIE concept really is about a unified place for health data, integrating different types of health data and strengthening the tools that we have um, by bringing more types of data together that are complementary and, and inform one another. Um, that can't be accomplished without stakeholder alignment, without stakeholder participation. Um, certainly, we are all working in in that spirit together in the HIE steering committee. Um, but we know that there, there is work to, to continue to do to ensure that, um, that we are uh, all working towards um, this unified health data space, that we see the value that we are testing with integrated claims and clinical information, uh, for instance, and that, um, as an example, commercial payers are, are are in alignment with this vision and um, contributing potentially claims data to um, the to the um, health information exchange. We have um, brought claims data forward and into the health information exchange through the Department of Vermont Health Access, and we'd like to see the same in the commercial payer space. And that's a place. Uh, for work and advancement as we move forward together. Okay, thanks. So um, moving on a to look at um, 2021 major changes and accomplishments, there's two really key things that we wanted to point out. Um, one, uh, in this past year, the, well, as I'll remind you of what the Collaborative Services Project is before I jump in. So the Collaborative Services Project, as a reminder, was this idea that um, there was a sort of fractured development in health data exchange technologies. And if we came together on a unified look at how we'd like to aggregate and exchange health data, we can reduce duplication um, of services and ensure that we are um, working towards this creation of one unified longitudinal health record for each Vermonter to enable, again, and care delivery, care coordination, population health management, the myriad use cases that we think about when we think about health data exchange. So over this past year, um, VITAL has made significant progress in technical implementation of this project, meaning that now um, they've launched new capabilities to um, 
match patient records across a diversity of systems through our new master patient index. Um, they've completed terminology services, which standardize code sets into a terminology that's useful or a language that's useful to the end user of health data. They've deployed an integration engine, a platform for routing data um, to appropriate users, and um, most recently launched a new data platform, a consolidated data system relying on its standard data model uh, to enable consistent data sharing and use. Um, and that's what um, uh, health tech solutions is pointing to as the technology, the technical capabilities that are appropriate for what we're trying to achieve here in Vermont um, in terms of our vision for health data exchange. Because of all of that work um, that VITAL has done over the last few years to implement the collaborative services um, project technologies, Medicaid is now able to share claims data on the VHI. And we are now able to um, get a linked clinical and claims data set, which will ultimately help us manage um, performance um, for the Medicaid plan and for associated healthcare reforms. Um, so a lot of technical progress there. And the other major change in 2021 was the expiration of the High Tech Act funding, which we, we anticipated and we talked about last time we were in front of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, but we have, in the last year, much more information about what this means um, in terms of federal investment in health information exchange has been uncovered. So as a reminder, um, of what the U.S. High Tech Act did, which was basically sort of the stimulus money um, in, started under the Obama administration. It allowed um, Vermont to support Medicaid providers in purchasing electronic health record technologies. That was the Medicaid EHR incentive payment program. Some people call it meaningful use. Um, it allowed us to develop enhance, and enhance the VHI, the Health Information Exchange, including these collaborative services uh, tech, technologies that, were, that I just pointed to. It allowed us to develop care coordination and analytics capacities at One Care Vermont um, and uh, to maintain and enhance public health reg registries and data capabilities. So that was system and staff and to bolster the public health, or excuse me, blueprint for health operations with data and data services. So initially um, providing analytic services, uh, support for their clinical registry, and now use of data directly from the VHI to support program implementation and evaluation. So since that expired in um, September, um, we've secured on ongoing system development funding, but at a lower match rate. Um, and so we've been able to do this because CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has basically said we are committed to the idea that states need the capacity to collect and exchange health data in service of the Medicaid health plan, Medicaid operations, Medicaid providers, and Medicaid patients. So with a really specific focus on Medicaid. That is contrasting with the High Tech Act, which was stimulus money to be used more broadly um, to benefit the healthcare system. So those two concepts are being confronted, but we know what we know now is that CMS is continu committed to continuing this work. Why it comes in at a lower match rate is because we have to cost allocate to the benefit of Medicaid. So as an important component of this, um, we uh, have begun a process for certifying the VHI system through a process that CMS calls outcomes-based certification. This um, was an opportunity previously only available to um, things that CMS would consider part of the Medicaid enterprise. Um, so now they have enveloped the idea that health data exchange is part of the Medicaid enterprise. Um, and we, by obtaining certification, we're doing two things financially. We're opening the door to ongoing perpetual sustained funding for operations of the VHI modules or VHI system um, at a 75-25 match rate, which is cost allocated to Medicaid. So um, it will look something probably in the end like a 50-50 match rate. Um, and it also means that we can request enhanced funding for development activities. So those previously either came in at a 90% federal match rate or something close to it cost allocated for the entirety of the system. Um, once we're, we've requested a new federal match rate, we're, except, we're expecting something closer to a 65% federal investment ratio. So the certification process, which we talked a little bit about last year, has been um, really um, sort of, we've been seeing to it sort of intensively for over a year at this point. So we started with a subcommittee of the steering committee who helped us develop 
develop measures, and this those outcome measures are how we base certification of the system and ongoing um, funding. So CMS is basically saying we don't um, we don't want to focus on the fact that your widget does X and Y. We want to focus on the fact that you built a widget to support. Medicaid in some way, and you, we are going to measure your progress through an outcome measure. Um, so how do you support direct care, care coordination, enable public health, support AHA, or excuse me, um, AHS's uh, health reform priorities, things like that. Um, and so we went through a multi-month process to propose these um, outcomes measures to CMS. It's a new process for them. So they were learning like we were. Um, and we are one of the first states to go through it, maybe, perhaps the third at this point. Um, and so ultimately, they accepted our, our proposal of outcome measures. Um, and we, with, in partnership with VITAL, began reporting our collecting data to report um, that we are meeting the measures in May of 2021. Um, just uh, seven days ago, so just this last week, uh, we did our final certification review with CMS, which was a four-hour process of presenting the outcome measures back to CMS and showing them how the VHI system enables the, that measurement. Um, we got very positive feedback from that certification review, so we are optimistic in the fact that we will receive approval. CMS has a couple of months to do this, so any time between tomorrow and the next 90 days, certified VHI, and once we do receive um, certification, we'll begin to um, start the process for obtaining that ongoing maintenance funds for the VHI system, which is retroactive, um, as well as um, in, uh, proposing an enhanced federal match rate for the system enhancement work that we have planned for 2021. So I feel like I just said a lot, so why don't I pause for a second before I jump into 2022 activities and Susan, I assume this is okay to stop partway through and ask for questions, but you tell me if you want me to wait till the end. Mr. Chair, what do you think? <laughs> Usually we wait till the end, Emily, if that's oh, okay. Oh, we wait till the end. Okay. Emily, I can just jump in and give you a break if, if you'd like. Sure. <laughs> give you a moment to catch your breath. I, I just can't underscore uh, enough the work that Emily and the team did um, in this new process of the outcomes-based certification. Um, this, this, it is a new process with CMS, as Emily mentioned. We're among some of the first states to go through this process. Uh, it's a totally different, um, you know, model than what we've what we've um, been working with to date, and I think it's taken. It's taken a lot of uh, work and creativity, as well as um, as well as persistence, to get through this um, this kind of evolving and new program with CMS. And I think that they've done a fabulous job with the team um, in navigating this this new area. And 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 I I just want to give them praise where praise is due in that regard. And of course, we're we're very um, hopeful that we get the information back soon, uh, and that it is positive for the state of Vermont and the HIE. Thanks for saying that, Ina. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out Vital's enormous role here, um, in particular Carolyn Stone team, Carolyn Stone's team. Um, they did a great job presenting the system to CMS, and um, the feedback we heard was Vermont's demonstrating best best practice. We're going to show other states um, here what you've done. We want to, you know, create the model based on what you've presented, it. and that was due in large part to how um, Carolyn's team presented the system, which was really exciting to see. Okay, so I'm going to jump into 2022 activities to look at the year ahead. Um, so these are kind of broken down into different parts, but I'll say there um, there's a nuance to each. Um, and, you know, as you all are well aware, we are working towards sort of moving towards the goalpost each year further and further. So we will do in part some work um, to progress our efforts each year. So when we think about 2022, um, first up is governing use of expanded health records on the BHI. Um, so as we've talked about for uh, the last couple of years, we've had the intention of using the VHI or this sort of central key repository 
uh, key health data repository that's central to our unified health data space to begin to aggregate additional data types that would constitute um, factors of um, that influence or are, are of uh, people's health and well-being. So we are talking about um, expanding the um, sort of traditional clinical health record to include uh, social determinants of health data, claims records, mental health and substance use disorder uh, services data. And so those are left out of the health records for various reasons, which are articulated in the HIE plan, um, but we can go more into that if that's of interest. And um, so by doing this, by expanding the health records and adding these additional data types that sort of fall out of the traditionally regulated clinical data, um, we are acknowledging that there's a need for more formalized, robust data governance to ensure the security and usability of health records on the system. So the HIE steering committee is committed to um, supporting development of, continually supporting development of functional data governance that aligns stakeholders and ensures that we are sa safeguarding new new uh, types of data in alignment with stakeholder preference and uh, federal and state statute. Um, so that's something that um, will really kick off in earnest in this coming year. And it's going to be a new partnership um, and a new way of thinking about health data. Um, so there's uh, this is the beginning of an evolution, I'd say, of how we are um, sort of formalizing data governance. It won't finish this year. We'll, we will kick it off. Um, so that's one concept is thinking about um, how we are um, appropriately protecting and using health data on the VHI as it expands. And another um, sort of concept under our need for uh, governing uh, the health records on the VHI is just this idea that um, the VHI system has um, recently upgraded and offers an incredible uh, service now that potentially was um, underutilized before or not available before, which might which positions vital to um, offer more data services to additional customers. And so that um, shift in the the um, business model means um, that we need to keep our eye on how um, AHS is and Vital's uh, governance relationship exists and how just generally the governance of the system um, is uh, transparently articulated to the public and um, how the system is used generally. So um, the steering committee will continue to evaluate its role as it relates to governance on sort of both of these fronts and think about uh, its relationship with the vital board of direct directors and vital itself. Um, so next up here, thinking about 2022 planned activities. So last year we talked a lot about um, public health integration with the VHI because Vital and the Department of Health had, did such an exceptional job in partnering um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemic. So, of course, that work has continued and evolved and become more sophisticated over time. Um, there's some examples listed here. I, I won't go through them. And there's more in the HIE plan itself. But um, catalyzing on this momentum and making sure that we are picking up on kind of this national push towards leveraging HIEs in service of public health management, we're going to be using 2022 uh, to develop a public health and VHI integration strategy. So this will think about the public health, our goals towards to our goal to create one longitudinal health record for each Vermonter on the VHI, um, including maximizing public health data to do that. And also the fact that the VHI has new robust um, data service capabilities and how the Department of Health can be leveraging those data capabilities to support public health management. So looking at it from both of those frames. Um, and we hope to next year come back with um, a more specific look at um, sort of our path ahead in terms of um, public health's use of the VHI system and data and how um, VITAL will be leveraging the data um, aggregated at the Department of Health. So next year, we'll also be thinking about leveraging the unified health data space to support um, Medicaid operations. And by this, we again mean VITAL is the or the VHI is the central health data repository, feeding it into and out to uh, different health data systems. So we're thinking about this on sort of two fronts. Um, first, generally just to support um, Medicaid performance management, because we understand that to manage risk and overall performance of the Medicaid health plan, including a 
associated health reforms, we need linked, linked clinical and claims data. And as I talked about, we are now um, submitting claims data to the VHI and benefiting from a linked clinical and claims and benefiting from linked clinical and claims um, data on the VHI. Um, specifically, VITAL will also be transmitting a clinical data feed back to Medicaid to ensure that Medicaid can comply with the new federal interoperability rules for patient access um, so that if an individual asks for their healthcare encounter data or their claims data from their Medicaid health plan through a 30-party application on their phone, um, they can get the full record um, from Medicaid directly. So, you know, when we think about um, preparing Medicaid providers to participate in value-based purchasing models. Um, first and foremost, they need the ability to collect data and to exchange it um, across uh, provider ne networks using uh, the health information exchange. And unfortunately, because the Medicaid um, Meaningful Use uh, program was a bit restrictive, not all Medicaid providers are, are able to do that. So um, the federal government has get, provided us the opportunity to continue an EHR incentive program, but run it um, as we see fit um, with uh, federal investment. And so we're going to be looking into designing a program in this coming year that really targets uh, Medicaid providers, particularly those that are participating um, in our near-term um, value-based uh, purchasing models. Um, and so really the um, so really what we will first be doing is looking across the system and seeing where their data collection gaps and where the needs are. Do folks need referral tools or care coordination tools or electronic health records? What is the data collection capacity that they need? Um, and then we'll look at actually incentivizing folks, providing um, money to purchase these tools and a means to um, connect to the health information exchange. Um, and we'll use a subcommittee of the health information exchange steering committee to design this program. So we really have um, a, a cross-sector perspective on, on the program's design. Okay, so moving on, um, the final thing here for thinking about 2022, this is not new, we, this was brought up last year, but just really wanted to highlight sort of the shift in the health data access um, environment or landscape um, that really kicked off in earnest with the launch of the federal patient access and interoperability rules. So these um, first and foremost, um, actually I'll just go to this next slide. Um, so these are two rules that have brought uh, together a technical framework from the Office of the National Coordinator and a regulatory framework from CMS to really put patients at the center of their health care by driving systems that make their data more accessible to them. So this is happening in a lot of different ways, but the easiest sort of one I think to understand is now patients are able to use third-party apps on their phone um, to request their health records from HIEs, from payers and some from some providers. It also those these rules are also driving payers to um, interact more effectively um, so that they they save costs and they um, reduce um, sort of administrative burdens that can um, hinder care. Um, so these rules aren't new, like I said, to this year. They did kick off in the previous year. We will likely start to see more of an evolution of how uh, patients are using their data. Um, and and that really impacts how we're thinking about how to evolve the health data system so it supports all of its users because patients are a real user now. Um, as part of um, sort of this comp concept of improving access, Vital will also be launching a new provider portal. And the idea here is just to continually improve how health records are accessed and used and made meaningful um, to support care delivery. So that's a sort of a brief summary of 2022. Um, and as I mentioned, we wanted to kind of launch back into the um, HIE ecosystem. And again, this is the environment required to advance health data exchange efforts. So previously, we had this really myopic fo focus just on technology and the HIE steering committee through the HIE plan is really acknowledging that we need to advance multiple fronts, financing, policy and process, governance, in addition to technology in order to advance health data exchange in the state. So we're going to take these piece by piece. Okay. Oh. 
So, um, oops, yeah, I should be showing you that there's the triangle, there's the ecosystem. So let's talk about governance for, um, first, or um, the structure that we would need to govern, it, govern the security and accessibility of data itself. So um, from the vantage point of um, the steering committee and the subcommittees who informed them in 2021, we continued the collaborative services subcommittee. Um, this was a group that was formed to provide strategic insight to VITAL as they selected um, the technologies for the collaborative services project um, and they implemented them and then provided an assessment back to the, the steering committee itself as the sort of technical advisors uh, to determine if the system would appropriately um, meet their, their needs, which they did determine, uh, which is included in the HIE plan. The Connectivity Criteria Subcommittee, um, and Carolyn's going to talk more about this, um, is a group that will continue year over year to support VITAL in reviewing and updating the connectivity criteria or the standards for exchanging data um, with the HIE. The Interface Prioritization Subcommittee is a group that we launched a couple of years ago so that there's a cross sector, uh, a group of a variety of stakeholders who are um, providing insights on how um, public dollars are used to advance connections between um, data collection systems and the HIE and helping us prioritize those. Of course, because of the pandemic, um, really the focus of connectivity the last couple of years has really been labs or um, systems that are collecting COVID results to ensure um, uh, that, that the Department of Health and healthcare providers have needed data for COVID response. So that's really been the thrust of connections over the last couple of years. Um, but we expect to sort of get back to um, relatively normal terms in, term, in terms of progressing connections between electronic health records or care, care coordination tools and the HIE. The claims, the cl claims sub committee was new this year um, and um, because of our ability now to integrate uh, claims data onto the VHI. So this was a group who came together to begin articulating cases for a linked clinical and claims data set to really help Vital understand how the system could be used um, to with claims data on it. Um, so this group did an incredible amount of work, which is all um, on the website if anybody's interested in looking at the use cases and sort of a deep dive into how claims data could advance work from this variety of perspectives, and they'll continue next year um, to, to um, articulate and oversee how um, claims data on the VHI uh, can support um, these myriad use cases. And finally, the part two group is not a new group either. Their group um, run by uh, VITAL to bring together stakeholders around uh, the development of universal policies and procedures for sharing um, data that um, we'd call clinically sensitive, substance use disorder data, mental health data, women's health data, other behavioral health data, um, to ensure that um, one federal rules allow uh, the policies and procedures for aggregating these new data types on the VHI are stakeholder informed um, and endorsed. So that's a look at this past year. So looking ahead at what these groups will do in terms of our governance structure. So we'll be combining the interface prioritization subcommittee and the connectivity criteria subcommittee, which are both groups that provide insights on connections to VITAL. Um, so they'll continue their great work um, and we'll continue to update the connectivity criteria year over year, which lives in the HIE plan. Um, we'll be introducing a new subcommittee, the Population Health Subcommittee. So this is where we'll be thinking about how social determinants of health data um, can be aggregated onto the VHI from the perspective of how we'd govern uses of this new data type, as well as how we'd prioritize projects or data aggregation efforts um, onto the VHI. So a lot of great work, great work I'm sure, um, is anticipated for this group um, in the year ahead. The Part Two Plus group will continue um, as we await for federal as we await federal rules um, regarding sharing of forty of data governed by forty two CFR Part Two. Um, they'll continue to engage um, substance use disorder uh, data. Uh, sources and other um, producers of clinically sensitive data and what it might mean to uh, share data through the VHI. We'll continue our claims subcommittee, I guess we shouldn't call it the pilot anymore, just the claims subcommittee to um, to meet to guide implementation of efforts to aggregate and utilize claims data produced by the VHI or excuse me provided by the VHI. And we'll introduce this new, uh, a new group, the Medicaid Data Aggregation and Access Program. This is the group that's going to be looking at designing an EHR incentive program for Medicaid providers to be able to collect data um, 
from their own facility and to exchange data through the Beehive. So that's a look at governance. To um, jump into another facet of the HIE ecosystem policy. So um, here you're seeing the HIE policy and process maturity model. So when we thought about strategic planning a few years ago, um, you know, we knew that um, Rome couldn't be built in a day. And so there was going to be an evolution of each of these facets of the ecosystem. So when we thought about policy and processes that we need um, to enable data exchange, um, we um, we um, conceived that it it began with sort of an organizational focus um, or individual data sharing preferences managed in each care setting all the way to the ideal um, scenario, which is that sharing of data sources that constitute an entire an individual's entire health profile or be supported by state and federal policy. So we feel like we're somewhere in the middle here, of course, with a shift in um, the consent policy in 2019 that was in, that um, went into effect in 2020. We feel like we're closer to the statewide consent management module, mo uh, management uh, model, excuse me. Um, but our needs will continue to evolve, and as we add new data types, we're going to be thinking of new means for consent. So in this past year, um, Vermont's law and immunization records was amended. Um, to allow for bi-directional exchange from the state's immunization registry to the VHI, which is huge, um, a huge uh, milestone because now it allows um, data, uh, immunization record data um, to populate the longitudinal health records um, on the VHI and it will allow the VHI to ensure that the immunization registry has the most up-to-date immuniza immunization records. So great progress there. We expect that the actual technology for bidirectional exchange will um, be implemented next year. Um, of course, we talked about the federal laws directing patient access and health record exchange um, through the patient access and interoperability rules. Um, a lot of that framework has not been produced yet, and we expect that um, it will continue, um, that CMS and the ONC will continue to provide sort of a framework around that. So there's more to come on that um, and uh, more to see in terms of patient use of their data. And um, as I noted, we're thinking about the policies and processes that are needed to enable the aggregation and exchange of clinically sensitive data, social determinants of health data, and I'd add to that claims data. Okay, so looking at how the resources we use to support our health information exchange um, efforts. And on the right here, you're seeing, again, a look at how we think the HIE financing model would mature over time. We think we're somewhere in the middle here um, where we've evolved from um, just this concept that public funds are the sole source of funding to the idea that we're thinking about a diver diversifying revenues for our HIE systems, um, working towards sort of that long-term goal of something that looks like a more sustainable relationship between public and private investment. So we've gone over some of this on the left here with the U.S. High Tech Act funding expired in 2021 and what that means. Um, I noted that CMS continues to offer states um, the opportunity to fund health information exchange efforts, but with a different funding model. Um, we're pursuing outcomes-based certification to obtain ongoing maintenance funds and the ability to request in for uh, enhanced federal match rates for development work of HIE systems. Um, and let's see here. So that's kind of the federal look. The steering committee itself um, notes in the HIE plan that um, we need sustained public funding in order to advance our work, our the vision articulated in the HIE plan year over year. And that sustained funding comes from the HIT fund, which is a portion of the um, state's tax on commercial claims. And so they're suggesting that we extend that um, every year. Right now it's extended through 2023. And finally, um, the final consideration here is that the collaborative services project is expected to position the VHI to provide demand-driven services. This means that the system itself um, can meet um, users' data needs and data services needs um, outside of um, what the public, uh, sort of the public good HIE infra infrastructure might look like, um, which is positive in terms of so supporting a sustainability model um, that um, relies on both public and private investment. Um, but we are just at the beginning stage of the stages of this, um, so that business model um, is not totally known to us yet. Okay. Um, 
And I think we've gone over data governance here, but just one more note um, just on the importance of um, thinking about the steering committee's um, role and thinking about how we how we govern and manage data exchanged through the VHI. And the population health subcommittee will really be foc focusing on this in the year to come as it relates to the exchange and aggregation of social determinants of health data. The part two group will be thinking about universal policies and processes um, for enabling um, aggregation and exchange of clinically sensitive data. And the claims subcommittee will think about how legislative um, changes may re be required and policy and, pr and processes are needed to enable um, or really maximize uh, this data service of linking clinical and claims data through the VHI. So all those fronts. And finally, um, a look at technology. So I keep pointing to this idea of Vermont's unified health data space. If you see the gray box in the center, that's the health information exchange. So this is our data repository, um, you know, that can um, match records across a diversity of systems, making them accessible for a variety of users and ensure security and do consent management on a variety of fronts and then push data out uh, depending on user need. Um, so this is perhaps a more simple look at, at um, kind of the system that we aim to build. Some of these things are in place now, like most of the gray, what's in gray now is it is um, exists today. Some of these other things exist in part, like bidirectional exchange for with public health registries is um, coming soon, um, or pushing VHI data out to the Medicaid care coordination tool, for example, exists today. Um, but other things are um, envisioned um, in terms of um, creating the appropriate technical architecture to, to realize um, the goals that we've set forth, forth in the HIE plan. So that is, those are all of my slides. So I'm gonna, you know, any final thoughts before we turn it over to Vital for the presentation on connectivity criteria? I think before we turn it over to Vital, we might uh, wanna ask you questions. So, Ina, did you have some final thoughts or do you want us to just jump in? Jump in, please. Okay. So, I'll, I'll start. Um, Emily, you talked about um, one of the goals in 2022 is um, really a, a new provider view. And what what's different? What, what will the uh, provider see in this new provider view? Yeah, Beth or Carolyn, I'd love to turn that one to you because they'll be launching the new provider portal and I think they can provide a great perspective on that. Yeah, um, I'll start, Carolyn, if you want to add in. Um, so the new provider portal, our goal is um, to make it a more user-friendly interface one, which I think we don't have. Um, I think the the new portal will present the data, particularly in a French sheet, in a more holistic um maneuverable way is the language I might use to get a, a view of what, what the patient's data and what's available. We will be able to expose more of the patient's data than we have been in, in the existing provider portal. So there'll be some, some important data made available to providers that I think is really important. Um, but one thing I will say, and Maureen is on the call and I know she may want to jump in as well, is um, we intend to continue enhancing this portal. So in, in a lot of ways, We'll, we'll be replacing and somewhat enhancing what we have now, but then Maureen will be leading a really good pilot and then ongoing process of um, stakeholder engagement to understand what else they might want to see. So what other functionality would be helpful for them to have in the portal? And then we will continue to enhance it from there. And this new portal will allow us a lot of flexibility to be able to do that, which we don't have with the current portal. So um, if they want to see data presented in a certain way or be able to track panels of patients, we'll have some flexibility to create that capability in it. So you may want to pass my second question to Beth to Emily, but that really is you were focusing on the uh, transition of the financing. And um, uh, my question is, when do we get to the point where um, providers across the state see so much value in front of them that they would be willing to uh, pay for each time there's a click or what have you? Yeah, I mean, I would love Beth's insights, but I, I just I do want to say that the steering committee continues to kind of grapple with the concept of what is a public good as it 
as it pertains to the health information exchange infrastructure? And then what would be a demand driven services? What would demand driven service, excuse me, what can someone buy? And I don't think we've come to a final definition on that. I don't know that we, it, I mean, it's sort of a live discussion. Um, so, you know, obviously Beth, please weigh in on the um, value proposition of the VHI, but just to say that I think we're on the precipice of this conversation and it's, you know, the steering committee is, is interested in um, getting to um, a more concerted definition around public good so they can support the state in investing in something that has the broadest benefit. Yeah, Emily, I, I think I agree with what Emily said, and I think that's a really important point is we, we want to develop kind of the perspective of what the foundational kind of the to ensure equity and availability for everyone, what that kind of baseline service is. But I, I, I know then as um, there are additional services and capabilities we can offer that I think will have significant value to providers, payers, things like that. And that's also where we're looking at potentially charging for services where we're adding on to that foundation and providing additional value and capabilities to them and likely leading to operational savings or improved efficiencies, things like that. Okay, so um, we'll go in alphabetical order of the board members, starting with board member Holmes, Jessica. Okay, well, thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess I just have a couple questions. As you think about moving to adding more clinically sensitive uh, data and the social determinants of health data, it seems really critical to have uh, a consumer voice on that steering committee, and I noticed that's still vacant. So I wanted to hear uh, a little bit more about why it's still vacant on the steering committee and what the plans were to fill that position. Um, well, first of all, it's it's a great and important question, and I think there's kind of there's a couple of ways to look at it. Of course, the consumer voice on the steering committee, which has been a struggle to fill because it it's really such a um, it's a position that requires a lot of dedicated time, and not everybody's going to have the interest and the time to to um, to give to the group. So certainly a gap there and, and something that needs to be filled in the steering committee absolutely recognizes that. The other thing that is on the forefront of the steering committee's mind is um, thinking about how to better engage existing stakeholder groups and reach out to um, gain insights from providers, from consumers, from those impacted um, by changes in um, the data exchange models. So I think both of those things are really important considerations to be around like sort of how we get um, more of a voice into um, the development of policies and processes that are impacting how we're exchanging um, new types of data. Um, and Maureen from Vital has done a great job of engaging um, the substance use disorder community around how new data can be exchanged and using them as gatekeepers to their constituents to really understand how new policies would impact folks and how folks would feel about new data sharing arrangements, which was sort of building off um, our shift in the, the consent model um, in March of 2020. Um, but we're going to need to do something similar every time we add new data or we shift the consent model or anything changes. And so um, I'm just not really answering your question, but just pointing out that it's really important. Thank you. Well, I hope you do continue that work because I think it really is an important voice to have. Um, and I guess my second question really is about if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by social determinants of health data, like what specific fields you're thinking about adding. And then with that, who will be using it, how will it be used to help us better understand some of the, um, and act on some of the health inequities that we suspect are out there, but this data will help us, you know, really evaluate. So wondering what the fields are, who's gonna use it, how it will be used to help us understand health inequities. So um, the first part of the question is the easiest to answer, um, which is like, how do we define social determinants of health? And, you know, as what's probably underscoring your question is the fact that like when you say this term, social determinants of health, people think of lots of different things, homelessness or food insecurity, transportation issues, you know, lots of different impact things that could impact someone's health and well-being. 
Thankfully, um, the ONC through a project called the Gravity Project has begun to standardize um, data uh, terminology for exchange in clinical settings um, that can be couched as social determinants of health data. So we can start there with those um, standards. Standards. And they're, um, I think that they talk, they, they call them domains, but they're, the domain areas are um, sort of generally what people would think of when they think of social determinants of health, including the examples that I've provided. So that's a starting place for us. Um, and at AHS this past year, what we've, we've begun doing is aggregating data that falls within those domains so that we are able to use the VHI to collect social determinants of health data produced by the agency. So that's... Um, in that practice that's that's provided a good framework for us to at least begin this project. What we, the latter parts of your question are a little bit harder to answer because I think the population health subcommittee is really gonna help us define new sources of data for social determinants of health, how that data is gonna be used, by whom, when, you know, sort of the whole framework for data sharing and their work hasn't kicked off yet. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Those are my questions, appreciate it. Thanks, Jess. Next, we'll move to board member Lunge. Robin. Thank you, and thank you, Ina and Emily, for the presentation. Um, so I was, I have a bunch of questions. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the governance issues that you're talking about in terms of uh, the focus for 2022. Are you speaking specifically to, for example, membership or purview of the HIE steering committee? Are you speaking to like the vital board, both? Uh, could you just be a little more concrete about what that work entails in terms of uh, defining the expanded governance? So yeah, there's a lot of considerations here and under a broad umbrella of, of governance. Um, so one is this idea of um, sort of more traditional data governance, which is um, policies and processes that allow for the appropriate and secure um, you know, use of uh, data that would be aggregated through the VHI. And so when we talk about data governance specifically, we're talking about, you know, adding these new data types. How do we ensure um, that they are appropriately, the new data is appropriately used, right? So that's um, one piece of it that will be seen to by the population health subcommittee, the part two group is thinking about those policies and uh, potentially um, proposing a consent model to reflect clinically sensitive data. And then the claims subcommittee ultimately will need to think about that as claims data uses potentially expand through the VHI. So that's the that kind of like the part of it that's data governance. Um, in terms of this, steering committee's relationship with the vital board that um, that needs to evolve and focus on the fact that um, vital will be offering expanded data services to um, groups outside of state government or not on behalf of state government um, and so what that looks like will really be contingent on what how vital evolves its business model okay that's answering your question yeah no that's that that's very helpful. Um, in terms of the latter piece, um, that's an area that I think, um, and I'll just tell you my opinion um, as a Green Mountain Care Board member, is it seems to me like that that latter piece about the, the external stakeholders and the overall direction is part of what the HIE plan is meant to address, is to ensure that not just state government actors, but uh, the whole HIE space, private and public, is rowing in the same direction so that we don't have an HIE that's being, uh, for example, uh, creating multiple care coordination technology systems that uh, don't necessarily enhance uh, moving one set of care coordination processes forward. Um, so I'll just, uh, that I was, Part of why I asked the question is because I would be concerned about um, having, you know, the overall strategic direction be diluted and potentially um, uh, sort of pulled in different directions. So I'll just make that as a comment. But thank you for expanding on that. Um, in the funding 
area. I, I am also, I was in follow up to Kevin's question, I am very interested in this definitional issue around public good um, versus the end user services and how those sort of connect. In the plan, it seemed to indicate that uh, the public good components might be in your three tiers, the first two tiers, the foundational and the exchange services. Um, and I was wondering if that was driven by the, the CMS uh, Medicaid enterprise system criteria and rules um, versus, uh, which to your point about funding would uh, kind of essentially limit how much of the total cost that Medicaid could support because it does need to be focused on Medicaid patients, understandably. Um, or if there was something, some other considerations that maybe I didn't pick up on in reading the report. Yeah, so I think it's a conversation that started with the steering committee that's not yet well articulated in the plan is the fact that um, the HIE services model, like what you're saying, that there's three tiers, um, that each of the parts of those tiers, the blocks of those tiers, is nuanced. So, like, for example, we have data aggregation as a foundational service or an exchange service, you know, kind of at the bottom. But data aggregation, like sort of in general terms, means connecting data collection systems with the HIE. So then the question becomes, this is just an example, is it the public's responsibility to pay for all connections from electronic health record systems to the HIE? So there's these, there are nuances in each of those um, sort of blocks of foundational services. Some are easier, like you know, providing a master patient index that allows you to match records across a diversity of systems. That's one system that state government can sustain um, in service of this goal of having a longitudinal health record for each Vermonter. So. There's, there are more conversations, I think, that need to happen. And um, Beth's talking about the provider portal, even the provider portal. What is the line between equitable access to health data and providing kind of bells and whistle services that a healthcare organization might buy from Vital? And those are all things that need to be better defined. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so I did take a look at um, the metrics that uh, you mentioned that were the outcome metrics that uh, were in the appendix of the plan that you and Vital will be reporting on for um, uh, to the feds. And one of the questions it raised for me is whether there needs to be alignment in uh, Vitals reporting as part of their budget to those metrics. And so I don't think you, anybody has to necessarily um, answer that now, but I, it, it might make sense for us to think about the metrics we currently get and how to align that on a broader basis so it's not just Medicaid focused moving forward. Um, so you're welcome to comment, but also if folks want to think about that, I'm happy to uh, get feedback on that at a later time. I mean, I think it's a great idea. And Beth, I think it looks like you want to add to. Yeah, I think that it's a good point is as we go forward into next year, I think we want to have some conversations with your vital wants to have some conversations with the board team about what goes into our regular packet, because we have had some shifts and we do want to represent the current work. So I think that's a great time to start those conversations. Great. Thank you. Um, my last, um, question is about, you had mentioned that the claims subgroup would be identifying potential legislative changes needed to further that work. Um, and I was curious when you would expect that work to be completed. Ina, do you want to weigh in on that one? Well, I don't, uh, I don't think that we would expect that to necessarily be completed in advance of this legislative session, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, I just wasn't sure how far along it was, if this was a stream of work that really needs to start at some point in 2022 or, or you know, if there'd been already been some thinking. So that's what I was trying to suss out. And that's it for me, Kevin, thank you. Thanks so much, Robin. And next, we're going to turn to board member Pelham. Tom? 
Well, thank you all for um, a very um, thorough and um, intense uh, presentation. This is very complicated stuff and it's hard to keep track of it. And uh, I appreciate um, you know, all the work that has gone in, in my experience, going back to opt in and opt out, which seemed like a pretty simple, you know, thing to thing to grapple with. This <laughs> this is is very very dense stuff. Um, my first question uh, has to do, I think, with your first goal, which was, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, one record, uh, uh, the one record per per uh, patient or per person here. Um, I see that patients and people, um, so I'll try to use the current terminology, one person per people. One um, is you um, said because of the uh, collaboration project that uh, you were at 95%. So I, I'm, I'm just asking, so if this is your top goal, but your experience now is a 95% unity between um, looking somebody up and getting the right person, um, is how much farther is there to go? Well, I think you're pointing to a really important thing, which is that Vital's new Master Patient Index is doing incredible work to match records across systems, and it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's having a really high success rate in doing that matching. What we need to do now, I think, is add records, so add more information to the VHI that would go through the master patient index, be matched so successfully and add to the longitudinal health record. So on patient patient matching, definitely hitting that one out of the park. Vital's doing a great job and that new technical service is working exactly as planned. The the next step there is adding more information. So you're 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 building on the ninety five percent. It's not getting to the ninety five percent anymore. Yeah, we'll just continue to use that system. So add more records and continue to use the great system to match them to, to one patient. So my second question has to do with the issue of bringing commercial payers uh, more engaged with this process. And um, I'm just wondering if there's anything as anything that you see or anticipate where the board might be helpful in that regard in terms of our authorities um, relative to regulating uh, private insurance companies. You know, do you want to add to that one? There isn't something that I, might, I can identify at this point, but I think it's a conversation that we should certainly continue to have um, as we move forward and and um so so i i appreciate the question i don't have an an answer off the top of my head but again i think it's an important question uh, important um topic for continued discussion i mean i ask that because uh my observation i'm just obviously speaking for myself is that you know the commercial carriers are um happy to say they're all in on healthcare reform but when you look at uh, um, the, the uh, change in the payment system, you know they're down at one to two percent um, in terms of their uh, true fixed fixed prospective payments. And so I, I just uh, I um, um, so, so you know if if there's some if there's something where we can do and be helpful, well, we should at least uh, make sure the door is open. Maybe we can't be, but uh, you know the door should be open. Uh, at that level. Um, I do share the concerns, I think that both Robin and Jess were um, uh, referencing in terms of uh, the consumer rep, you know, um, on, 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 on the uh, steering committee, um, especially as, as we go down the road toward bringing more definition to what is um, a social determinant of health and um, try to integrate um, in the more individual access into having access uh, um, to, to their own information, um, that at some point in time, there might be some tensions there. And I think that um, as we, the sooner we, we get engaged in those tensions, the better off we will be um, in, in bringing advocates for privacy um, 
uh, to the table in a way that uh, doesn't undermine what we've accomplished to date. Um, <clears throat> so that's that uh, ob observation. Um, I think there was one more. Oh, there was one more. You may remember that we had a, I think it was a primary care advisory committee member and part of the topic um, had to do with the VHI. Um, and the, the, fo the folks at the meeting, our advisory were advisory committee meeting, primary care advisory committee were the principals in their, in, in, in their, um, uh, uh, what I want to call it in, in their, um, I'm blanking on the word in, in their, uh, in their business, they were the principals and they didn't they, when we asked them or they were asked, you know, how much they use this sit the vital system, they basically said they didn't, and some of them said they get still get their information from the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. And after that got scrubbed a little bit, not at that meeting, but after, um, you know, Beth was concerned about it, rightfully so. It was basically that the people in the back office are the ones that use the system, and it's not necessarily the physicians themselves. So, so, so if they're asking for a test result, they're not quite sure, they don't have current knowledge as to where it's coming from in some cases. So um, I just want to emphasize that that was a little snafu that popped up. And uh, so it's just important to get the right people in the room, you know, when you're trying to sort through some of these uh, integration issues um, so that um, you you so that you have the right right people in the room. Um, so other than that, I, uh, I'm advantaged today by uh, going last. Um, and as we all recognize here, that's a a, a, um, an easier task to do. Um, I, I, I did want to talk more about social determinants of health and which what that means and and what that's going to mean when it hits the street um, and people start to say, well, you know, this record or that record is now going to be out there, um, um, <clears throat> you know, on the uh, on vital. So, um, but we're all aware of that concern and uh, um, let's uh, that's that, that those are those are the areas that I was interested in. Thank you. Thank you Tom. Uh, so next we'll go to uh, Beth's presentation. Beth. I'm actually going to pass this to Carolyn, who is our expert at connectivity criteria. Thank you. Um, Carolyn Stone from Vital. Um, so what we're going to run walk you through, as Emily mentioned, is just our annual update to the connectivity criteria. This criteria is a tiered system that kind of establishes standards for connecting and meeting the data quality goals, not only of the VHI, but of our downstream stakeholders. Um, and, you know, we've tried to base these connectivity criteria on the federal standards um, and this you know, that are part of the ONC Cures Act, and, and it includes the, the U.S. Core Data for Interoperability, or the U.S. CDI. Um, and what we've been doing is we meet with the subcommittee, and annually we review the existing criteria, and then, you know, we've added in the one new piece that we've added in this year is the claims data. Um, and we based a lot of our work and expertise um, on the data currently being collected by the Medi Medicaid agency for this year um, with, with the other stakeholders in the group who were there. And we tried to base that on existing data submission formats for the professional claims um, so that it, as a baseline to say, okay, you know, this is what we think will do for this year. As we start to utilize that data in 2022, we'll just be reevaluating this as a part of our annual go around. We reviewed the mental health, behavioral health and claims uh, and physical health data as well this year. And everyone agreed that we think that that's working fairly well. The, the mental health and behavioral health, we haven't had a chance to put into use. We're all still waiting for that SAMHSA guidance um, on how to handle that data correctly. Um, so we're going to leave it as it as we defined it originally. The one thing that we did um, 
update is we did add in uh, some the COVID-19 test results into kind of known data that everyone wants to get. Uh, and the reason we're just adding this at this late date is over the past year, there's lots of in-house testing machines now that are available to um, providers across the state um, to do testing in many different care settings now, not just you know sending. Originally, when the pandemic started, it was just labs doing these tests, but now there's there's widespread machines being deployed to you know specialty practices, primary care practices, you know all aspects of the continuum, um, and we're trying to capture that data now from from everyone. Uh, if they have it, you know, if they're doing that type of testing, then we would expect them to be able to transmit that. Um, and those are pretty much the the updates for this year. Um, you know, clearly we continue to work with healthcare organizations to ensure compliance with these criteria and uh, weave that into all of our processes. Okay, board members, do you have questions on the connectivity criteria update? Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. So next we'll, um, unless you have anything further you want to say, Emily, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Is that okay? That's great, thank you. Okay, so, um, any member of the public who wishes to comment on the um, presentation today about the Health Information Exchange Strategic uh, Plan and the 2022 connectivity criteria, um, please raise your hand, or if you're just on the phone, please speak up. And Walter, I see you're, you're first, so I'll call on you. God, I get to be first, wow. Uh... A couple shout outs to Jessica, Robin, and Tom for their mentioning of the no um, patient or on the steering committee. Um, another shout out to Tom for saying, not mentioning patients as consumers, that we are people. And then a couple questions. Um, exactly what is patient centered? And when you say measuring Medicaid claims, exactly what does that mean? And a note that if you start subscribing or start having subscription services for data, those costs will inevitably be passed on to us patients. So that is something to think about. And if you bring private insurance into that, the same thing's gonna happen. So I'll take a crack at uh, the question about patient-centered, um, Walter and and uh, Emily and the uh, and uh, Ina and Beth and Carolyn can tell me how that fits into um, the way they perceive it on the health information exchange. But to me, if something is patient-centered, um, the patient is the most important part of the system, and so everything should be looked through the lens of how it affects the patient, and how does it make it easier for the patient and better for the patient. But um, people from the IT world may have a different uh, definition, so I'll pass it over to them to see if uh, they have anything to add. I think we're with you, Chair Mullen, um, in terms of that perspective and kind of and that same vein of like sort of what the vital does, you know, um, and maybe to Tom's earlier point, you know, they have a behind the scenes service to support patients and providers um, and ensuring, you know, high quality care on behalf of the health and well and well-being of the population. So when we talk about claims on the VHI, we're not talking about measuring the claims themselves, we're talking about using claims data linked with clinical data to understand the patient's experience. So we're able to improve healthcare programming and curb costs. I think of the VHI as a, you know, providing information so others can do their work. And Walter, I didn't quite get your second piece. I think you said Medicaid, but I'm not positive. 
measuring Medicaid claims, and when I think of the word patient-centered, patient-centered has often meant specifically in healthcare terms where the patient suddenly is uninsured or <clears throat> has, oh, what's the word I want to use? But anyway, high deductibles and stuff like this, you know, they call it choice. But what it really is, is the patient goes from one plan to another of high deductible. So that's where I was thinking on my patient centered idea. Of course, it should be the patient. So let's follow this up. I, as a patient sitting in an orthopedic office in Copley Hospital or at the Mansfield Orthopedic Center, can I type in my own data or figure out how to get my own data to that physician? Because there was a slight problem, this was a few months ago, of actually getting data. So that's that's and another question. Where was when, the friction there, Walter, um, in accessing the data? Um, can was I it, access my own data? How's that? <laughs> As a patient, it's a great it's that? a great question. Um, I know that, um, for example, um, I can access my patient portal both at my primary care provider and at my local hospital, but. Um, how does that work for Vital Beth? Can a patient uh, access anything? Yes, we have um, currently. You can um, request to have a complete copy of your records that we have on the Bhi. And um, there's a process. Happy to follow up with you on how to how to get that information. So you can have a copy um, for yourself. Um, part of what Emily talked about in her presentation was for next year. We will be creating these, um, what's called uh, an API, and it's a very technical term, I realize, but basically that allows for an electronic interface for you. So if you wanted to use an application such as, I'm going to say an Apple Health type application, just because that's something people commonly um, are familiar with, to get your data from the Bihai and to see it in, in an app and have access to it. So, so right now it's more of a, you request it from us and we can send you a file, a printout. Um, we work with you to, to understand and how you want that data. But in the future, it will be more um, technically supported for you to have access to the data. Did that mm. address your question? Well, not really, but we'll go on. Um, when you say measuring Medicaid claims, what does measuring, I think I heard that word measuring in there. What exactly does that mean? Well, again, we're talking about using the HIE as a way to collect information and provide it in a meaningful way. So not measuring Medicaid claims, but using claims and clinical information to measure healthcare performance and to understand costs and effectiveness of care delivery. So not measuring the claims themselves, but using that as information for measurement. Okay, next I'm gonna call on Dr. Rick Hildebrandt. Thanks. Uh, I just had a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I think someone had mentioned that this was dense. Uh, I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer here at Runland Regional. This is an incredibly complicated topic, and you guys did a phenomenal job exp uh, explaining it to lay people. So, you know, really well done. Um, HIEs are really complex technology, and I think you did a, a really excellent job in explaining that uh, to the group here. So, thank you for that. Um, Beth, you had mentioned uh, API integration. I think that's really important. Um, when it comes to a, a patient's or a, I'm sorry, I refer to people as patients, uh, so sorry, part of my nature, but, um, or, or consumers' uh, perspective, they're going to want to control their information the way they want to, not the way we want to. And that's going to be via APIs, whether it's Apple Health or some other app. Um, they don't want to have to go to 14 different portals, I can promise you. They want it in one spot, um, and that API integration is really important, specifically with Apple Health, which is probably the most um, uniformly known. Uh, and the second thing I would say is um, patient and consumer voice is important. Provider voice is also very, very important, and I think that was mentioned once. Um, having the voice of your um, healthcare providers is incredibly important. Um, to make sure that we're, we're hitting this right. Um, 
I know there's not uh, a provider on your steering committee. Frankly, I don't know that many providers would have the ability given the time commitments, but finding a way to incorporate that voice. Thank you for volunteering, Rick. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know that I have the time, but uh, I do think it's a really important thing because um, when it comes down to it, you need to engage both your, your uh, consumers and your providers in this process to make sure you have seamless exchange. Thank you. May I, may I sure, say something in response to that? Rick, I appreciate your comments, and I, I think you've heard some of this, but just for the, the benefit of others on the call, I mean, that is something we are trying to do as vital going forward, too, and we, we've created a position internally to do some more of that engagement and conversation to really get feedback and input. We want to build tools and functionality and capabilities that meet the needs of the people who are going to use it, not just what we think is right and good. So we, we do, and you you will be someone we contact, as you know, we have already, um, but we will be reaching out and wanting to do that more. Okay, is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Seeing no hands raised and hearing none, I wish to thank everyone for a um, very comprehensive uh, presentation. I think uh, that uh, anyone uh, um, following the presentation today will have learned a great deal. And so um, thank you. And with that, is there any um, old business to come before the Green Mountain Care Board? Kevin, were you going to go back to Kate O'Neill? Because I oh, believe she had preliminary she staff. Did. She had staff. Uh, Recommendations. Yep. Yep. I do. Uh, and I will try to be very efficient with the time here. Um, I'm pulling up my slides uh, again. Um, and you should see my slide that says process. Do. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, big thanks to everyone who presented. Um, I, I'll just quickly walk through. Um, the, the process and then the, the principles that uh, were developed. Uh, Sarah Kinsler was very instrumental in having done that with the board last year, um, maybe even the year before. Um, and so because we have principles that we use to review the HIE plan um, and the connectivity criteria, I'm just going to run through those. Um, this is more um, kind of a sort of a general, uh, um, d does the HIE plan address these principles? Whereas uh, the presentation you just heard was much more specific to the the plan um, and planned activities going forward. But in terms of the process, um, AHS submitted the HIE plan um, on November 1st. We're currently in the middle of a special public comment period that ends on November 25th. And then following um, that, we uh, will incorporate any comment that um, that uh, we, we receive in um, our staff recommendation uh, to the Green Mountain Care Board on the HIE plan and the connectivity criteria. And then there will be a, a potential vote on December 1st. So you're not voting today. Um, so to support the board's review of the HIE plan and the connectivity criteria, um, we're working with the same four proposed uh, principles that were developed a couple of years ago, and they can be summarized as alignment with statute, that's first and second, uh, whether the HIE plan meets the goals of other recent relevant legislation, and, um, and whether the HIE plan incorporates national best practice and stakeholder input. So to address principle number one, the statute describes recommend, uh, requirements for the plan, including supporting effective, efficient, statewide use of electronic health information for a variety of purposes, um, educating providers and the public, supporting interoperability, proposing strategic investments in technology and infrastructure, recommending funding mechanisms, incorporating existing initiatives wherever possible, um, and uh, integrating technologies um, wherever possible. Uh, and then addressing issues related to governance and security. Um, you heard a lot about that in the presentations today. So um, we do find that this 2021 update to the HIE plan meets these criteria. The updated plan um, uh, also describes the technologies in place um, in 
the foundational phase one of the collaborative services project and describes activities underway in phase two of the new platform infrastructure um, and implementation. Um, and uh, so uh, they, they talked uh, much about the, um, the outcomes anticipated in this implementation and I just wanted to share them uh, here. For principle number two, uh, Act 48 established the, um, the 14 principles for healthcare reform. Um, and in its uh, decision to approve the HIE plan, um, originally the board found that the plan spoke to several of these principles and these areas remain core to the 2021 update. And this update is consistent with these principles. The HIE plan describes the focus for 2022, including the development of governance structures for expanded health records collection and um, data integration into the VHI, improving public health capabilities through data integration, refining the conceptual IT services model, leveraging the unified health data space to support Medicaid operations, uh, and improving access to health information um, for, uh, for uh, people, for consumers, and, um, and for providers and, and those who care for them. So the third principle focuses on alignment with other relevant legislation. Uh, this plan does integrate and build on recent legislation. In 2021, Vermont's law on immunization records uh, was amended to allow uh, immunization record sharing from the Department of Health's uh, registry to the VHI. Um, Vermont's Act uh, 53 of 2019 prompted the change to um, Vermont's HIE consent policy. In 2021, the HIE steering committee and the subcommittees began to contemplate changes to the state's protocols for access to protected health information on the VHI to enable um, aggregation and exchange of additional data sources um, such as social determinants of health, and we talked a lot about that. So in, in 2022, AHS, in partnership with VITAL and the HIE Steering Committee, will uh, work to articulate um, how public health operations can be enhanced through integration. Um, and the effort will include an analysis of policy and legislative changes that may be required for additional data sharing or data access arrangements between the Department of Health and the VHI. Um, and that's um, that's articulated throughout the or within the plan. Um, and additionally, the state and the HIE steering committee will um, work to further design consent and data governance processes that are needed for sharing and accessing claims, social determinants of health, and the clinically sensitive data, as was discussed. Finally, the fourth principle is, does the plan incorporate best practices and expertise as well as feedback from stakeholders? Um, so the HIE plan approved in 2018, built on national standards. Um, and since then, uh, Vermont with uh, guidance from the steering committee has taken uh, strides in both developing and executing IT strategies that Im improve redundancies and inefficiencies. That, um, that align with the state um, introduction of new federal rules that drive interoperability and the growth um, in the HIE marketplace. Um, in terms of feedback uh, from Vermonters, uh, you know, certainly talked a lot about that, and I know that um, that uh, there will be uh, more, more work done there in the HIE steering committee to include stakeholders uh, from a variety of constituencies um, uh, most importantly, um, the public and consumers. Uh, and, um, and then on the HIE plan and uh, technical roadmap, the HIE steering committee and its subcommittees include stakeholders representing hospitals, FQHCs, um, uh, one care, um, designated agencies, payers, et cetera. Um, integrating new data on the VHI policies and uh, processes that govern how data in the VHI is sourced, accessed, and managed are essential to respecting privacy and supporting effective care coordination. And the HIE plan incorporates the intent to involve stakeholders in the development of the data management process. And I'm confident you'll be hearing more about that um, 
as uh, certainly um, in December and then as uh, 2022 uh, moves forward in terms of operating um, or operationalizing this plan. Um, so moving to the connectivity criteria, here there are two principles for your review and um, they, they focus on alignment with the HIE plan goals and uh, clarity of the criteria themselves uh, since they're really an operational tool. Um, so are the proposed connectivity criteria in alignment with the goals and will they support implementation of the HIE plan? Uh, we believe the answer is yes. This year's connectivity criteria remain aligned with the HIE plan's goals and structure and will support uh, increased availability of um, and usability of um, the data, which is critical to uh, the achievement of Vermont's health reform goals. Um, the uh, connectivity criteria um, made minor adjustments with um, the physical health criteria included in tiers two and three, adding mental health and behavioral health data elements to support data exchange with designated agencies and other um, mental health um, and behavioral health providers. And these new data elements will continue to support the plan. And then two, are the proposed connectivity criteria sufficiently clear to be operationalized by VITAL? Um, and we find, yes, these criteria were developed to expand providers' uh, ability to submit and receive structured data from the VHI, um, in part providing specific standards and requirements to support Vermont's providers in contract negotiations with the HR vendors. Um, and that is all from me. Um, if you have any questions for me or, um, or the A-team uh, as staff having uh, reviewed this, let me know. Thank you, Kate. You did a, a great job in your first year taking this over from Sarah, and uh, we really appreciate all your hard work. Do any board members have questions for Kate? See you, some shaking heads, so I don't think there are any questions, Kate, so thank you very much. Okay, so I'll just remind you that um, the uh, you and all, the special public comment period is open now and it goes through November 25th. Uh, and you could go right to the Green Mountain Care Board um, website front page um, and to click on um, the opportunity to provide comment. Um, and the final staff recommendation to the board on the plan and the connectivity criteria will be on December 1st where um, the board will uh, potentially vote on the plan. And it's hard to believe that December is only two weeks away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, at this point in time, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show it was a unanimous vote. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.